This is Stephanie Lemelin, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Artemis, B, 0, 7. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome the incredibly talented Stephanie Lemlin. Her acting career stretches across both the big and small screen, appearing in live action, animation, and video games. But if you're listening to our show, then you probably know her best as everyone's favorite archer with a supervillain family tree, Artemis. Stephanie, I am so excited to welcome you to Whelmed. Well, thank you for having me. I feel like um, in many ways you have just added to my resume because now (laughs) I've done a podcast. Yes. (laughs) Welcome to podcasting. Thank you. Thanks for that. (laughs) I haven't actually done it yet. I'm attempting to. Yeah. Let's let's see how this goes before we we put it on the uh, resume. (laughs) So before we begin, I want to remind everyone listening at home that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics, and the video game. And while we can't talk any season three secrets or spoilers, we may talk a bit about the trailer that has already been released. So if you have not seen, read, or played all the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. We may also touch on some of Stephanie's other projects outside of Young Justice, and while we'll try our best to avoid spoilers, it might still happen, so just be aware of that too. Uh, And with all of that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in our intro there, but could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do? And building on that, what's your origin story? How'd you get into acting? Cool question. Um, (laughs) That one I know the answer to. It's a long one, though. How do I uh, sum it up quickly? Uh, So I'm a human being. (laughs) (laughs) And I am, you know, a daughter, a granddaughter, a sister, a friend, niece, a cousin. And then eventually I became a wife and then a mom. (laughs) And I moved around a lot as a kid and I saw a lot. And, um, and I wanted attention a lot. And so apparently all those things came together and somehow um, I got, you know, I don't know if I want to use the word lucky enough. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And I've worked really hard to make, you know, this my job. Yeah. But yeah, I'm an actor. So that's, that's what I do. (laughs) And, um, and I actually just recently did career day at my son's elementary school. He's in kindergarten. Yeah. And so that was one of the questions, like, how did I get into acting? And I was telling the kids when I was in fifth grade, or maybe it was sixth grade, I'd already been in five schools. And um, I was born outside of New Jersey, and I, I actually brought a glass of water for the kids. And I was like, what is in this cup? And they were like, water. And I said, you know, in New Jersey, they say water. They call it water. And then I moved to Canada and like French Canadians say a completely different word, which is actually a different pronunciation in the way Parisians would say um, water. And then I was saying how they say water in Calgary where I was living. And then I moved to Boston and they actually say water. And, you know, just kind of telling them from an early age, I wasn't, thinking of it as acting, obviously, I just was like, what do you guys say for this here? And what do you say for this year? Because I wanted people to understand me. Yeah. And I don't know that I ever worried or was, I don't know, interested in being part of the crowd or like everyone else or being cool. Um, Because part of moving around a lot meant that I also felt like, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to see you again next year, (laughs) which kind of gave me bad (laughs) habits sometimes. But, you know, I was just trying to understand where I was and make sure that people understood what we were talking about. So I had to speak like them. And, um, and so that was kind of an early informing, shaping experience that I didn't realize would play out the way it does now. 
Um, but yeah, I had an ear early on for accents and colloquialisms. How do you even say that word? Um, I'm saying that and then I can't say the word. <laughs> um, colloquialisms and uh, expressions and just kind of observing people and watching people. And I was talking to the kids actually about this, how you have to be a good listener to be an actor and you have to watch and learn and, you know, look at patterns and behaviors and all that stuff informed way before I really understood my career. And then I also had um, a dad that was kind of famous in the circle that we were traveling in because he was a professional athlete and a lot of people wanted his attention and we didn't see him that often. And then I had a brother. And so just within the home, I was fighting for attention. (laughs) Um, And so that also kind of pushed me to get bigger and louder and try harder all the time. Um, And then I was getting in some trouble when I got older, we were in Boston and we actually didn't move. And I was really mad about that um, because kids, there were kids were being really mean to me. And I was like, can we just move? Like, <laughs> I don't like it here. And, uh, and then we didn't, and that was really hard. I had to like stick it out and grow tougher um, and thicker skin to be able. And I found like humor was helpful to get people off my back. and. Um, And also, believe it or not, like I got into fights quite a bit when I was in middle school. And so it kind of morphed because there was this awesome teacher that pulled me aside and um, saw all these qualities that you could see as troublemaking qualities in me. And she didn't see them that way. It kind of makes me cry. Uh, But she said, you know, have you ever thought about doing theater? And she introduced me to this world where um, I could take all of my chutzpah and channel it positively. Um, Her name was Ellen. She's not with us anymore. That's why it makes me cry. But I, that teacher changed my life. Oh, that's so wonderful. In a positive way. Yeah. so wonderful. So um, I told you this was a long-winded answer. (laughs) But, you know, I- It's totally fine. Yeah. But I think we're going to kind of dive into superheroes. And I think that- in many ways, teachers can be superheroes. And she was one of mine growing up. Um, And then I started doing the school plays and I was like, oh, this is it. I was trying really hard, you know, to play sports. Trust me. (laughs) I wanted, you know, my dad, I wanted him to come to my games. And I actually got, uh, I got on the basketball team, which is hilarious. And um, I've never scored a basket the whole season. I think one time I scored on my own net, <laughs> but, um, but they loved having me on the team because they would put me on to guard the girl that could score baskets. Cause I would go down, like just blocking everyone out of her way. And, um, and so that happened, but I just wasn't, my brain wasn't really created to play sports, uh, team sports. And, um, but I was tough and I, and I didn't have fear and I would do anything um, to help, and I was competitive. So that was interesting. It wasn't the greatest combo. And it all kind of clicked when I started doing theater and I found you know, a way, again, for the things that came naturally to me and then also that I had learned as a result of my interesting, unique childhood, which all of ours are, by the way. <laughs> you have to see it that way. You know, and then it all kind of came together and I was, I was hooked. Oh, that's so great. It's great. Mm-hmm. I felt like being me wasn't a bad thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And then you like continued with it in high school and college. That, yeah, well, then in, in it was like my 16th birthday and my parents were like, what do you want? Do you want to have a sweet 16 party? This is what people do. And I was like, no, God, no, I don't want to do that. I would like to go to Broadway, <laughs> Broadway show. Me, me. <laughs> yeah. And my parents were like, what? And I was like, I've never seen New York City. And my dad's like, it's really big. It's not really one of my favorite cities. It's kind of overwhelming. And I'm like, that's not what I, I you asked me. You asked me what I wanted to do. <laughs> I didn't ask your opinion of New York. And so we took a train, which was so cool. And we did like a father daughter weekend. That was a tough time. Being a teenager is tough for everybody. Yeah. And so I think my mom was like, you need to do this with your dad. And, and my dad's not a theater person. Yeah. So God bless him. He went to three shows over the weekend. We went to like Les Miserables, which I didn't really understand deeply at that time, but I picked because it was French and he was French and I thought he would like it. 
I, I think I saw Miss Saigon. I don't know if that was Miss Saigon like blew me away. Yeah. I really loved musical theater at the time. I'm not a great singer naturally. I'm a good karaoke -er. Is that a verb? I'm a karaoke -er. Yeah. I think it should be if it's not. Yeah, it should be <laughs> because I sing with all my heart and all my body and everything and I'll act out the show and the song and whatever, but you know, I don't always hit all the right notes. I am relating to this on a spiritual level. Like, yeah, but me. it's like Same. so much fun and freeing. And I yes. love someone who gets up there and just lets it all out and gets the crowd involved. And to me, it's like such a great way to unite. And then from there, did you like move out to California or did you start your acting career in New York or? So no, because I still lived at home and I didn't have a license and all that yet. Um, but and I actually, Chile. yeah, I really wanted to yeah. move to LA and even though I'd never been there. And so I was fixated on going to UCLA, but yeah. not because I knew anything about the school. I just wanted to go to Los Angeles <laughs> and, um, and my mom didn't want me to go to California, period. She was like, you need to be – she really wanted me to go to school in Boston. And then she was, like, open to expanding to several places that were at least on the East Coast within driving distance. And I think I got in my head that senior year um, – I guess it's junior year when you're applying to colleges. And I just got really in my head – about, well, what if acting doesn't work out? You know, they really were like, you should really get a degree that you can fall back on. And I actually got accepted into an Ivy League school, which was such a big deal. My parents hadn't really, I think my mom went to a junior college, um, but you know, not, no one in my family had ever gone to one and it just was very prestigious and it put all this yeah. stuff in my head. And so I picked that school because they accepted me and that was the University of Pennsylvania. And then what I did was, without realizing it, I just went to school and acted like I didn't want to be an actor. <laughs> really? And I tried to be quote unquote normal and I tried to get, you know, I, I think I was in a communications major with an English minor, but you know, I, if I could go back in time, I probably would have done that differently. But then again, we are where we are because of those choices. Um, so it wasn't the easiest experience college for me. I don't think I was, I think I was a little square peg round hole during that, those years. I tried working at a law firm. Mm -mm. Um, I tried, I tried doing whatever I could you know, to make my parents proud. And I was psycho about getting good grades always. Um, and here I am so many years later and like, nobody cares where I went to college in my <laughs> profession, I don't think. And um, my degree doesn't really matter. But here are the good things. Here are the silver linings. Yes. I took every class I could while I was there. And I think that they actually all inform every choice that I make today. You know, I took oceanography. I took school, you know, part of the, I went to the law school. I went to the finance school. I went, I went to every single thing. I was trying so hard to find something that I liked other than acting. And, and these are all things that I bring to the characters that I do. If I'm playing yeah. a lawyer, you know, I was like, oh, I spent a summer interning at a law firm. I know what that, I know what a taste of that is. I don't actually know what that is, but you know, I think that's really important, not just doing acting classes, but real life's important. And so you know, and, and immersing yourself in different social circles is important. And I tried, you know, I went, I joined a sorority. Oh my gosh. And that, by the way, I had a really strong opinion of, and it wasn't really like exactly what I thought it was. Um, so that was important. But if I had to play a sorority character, you know, I was like, oh, I have some stereotypes in my head. And then I have some more three-dimensional characters in my head based on the experience that I went through yeah. in, um, at UPenn. And so I do think that there, I took a lot from those years um, and I encourage everyone to try and find silver linings all the time, even when you're in a situation that doesn't feel completely perfect, which by the way, what, I don't know how many situations ever feel that way. There's always opportunities for learning in everything you're doing. So for me, you know, those years were still invaluable, even though I wasn't pursuing a theater degree. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. All those experiences that can inform how you're acting and all that. Yeah. The minute that I graduated, I gave my degree to my parents and I was like, so I'm still going to LA. Bye. <laughs> and I did. I did. I was like 21. I moved out here by myself and they were so scared. And that first year was rough. 
yeah, I was working three jobs and I was living in a house with all these dudes. And, um, and then I got a dog, which was a life saving thing that I did during that time because it just, it felt like I had someone to take care of and someone took care of me and that yeah. dog and I were so bonded. And, um, and he was like a rescue pit bull dog. And it like put me on a different path for 10 years where I was very involved in volunteering at the shelter and working with animals. That's and cool. it just, that was like my church. And it just, yeah, for me, I just would go in there and be with people that were just absolutely committed to helping and the animals. And we were from all different walks of life, but we had that in common. And it helped me feel grounded um, and gave me a community. Yeah. When I first moved to LA, when I was like, you know, exposed to a lot of things yeah. and working my butt off, just trying to make it. Yes. Make it but, happen. Yeah. That's awesome. That is, all of that is awesome. That's an incredible story of how you got there. But shifting gears a little bit, sort of, uh, <laughs> Before you became part of Young Justice, before you joined the cast, did you have like any history with the DC or comic books in general? Not really. Um, again, I didn't, my family was not like the most artistic family. I grew up in a really sports oriented household. Everyone was just like very competitive athletes and my mom too. And so, you know, when I came out here, w one of the amazing things was just like, oh my God, there's so many people that care about TV and books and film and music and just everything that I loved. Um, and you found actually, your people. Yeah, it was. I mean, that's the, th that's the thing about Los Angeles that I actually love. And I'm sure that's about many big cities. There's actually something for everyone here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I met so many people that also moved here because they loved the same things I did. And that was um, exciting. And my world opened up and I learned a lot more. Um, but the guy that I fell in love with who I eventually married. He was really into comics. Oh. So yeah, when I first started dating him, he would order them online. They would like show up at his condo. He barely had furniture, but he had comics. <laughs> and um, he loved Wolverine, Batman, and the Punisher. And, uh, and so that was kind of my introduction truly to the whole comic world. That's really cool. World. Yeah. Uh, and so next, I'd usually ask our guests when they first saw Young Justice, but I don't think that that's really exactly the right question for you, all things considered. I don't, uh, I so, don't remember when I first saw it. I mean, it was probably, I don't know, I think the whole cast got together for, maybe it was the rap party after we recorded season one and they showed a clip. That sounds right. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I was just like chilled to the bone. I was like, this is what we've been doing. Oh my God. It was incredible. It blew me away. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I was going to ask if you could maybe talk a little bit about how you first got the role of Artemis, but that is also an awesome story. But like what the audition process was like or anything like that? Um, yeah. I mean, I I was different, I think. <laughs> My story was different than a lot of the other voice actors because I didn't really have a strong resume in voiceover. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's kind of a little bit dreamy because it's kind of that that person that's out there that's like, I just, you know, I want to just go out there and audition and maybe they'll actually look at me even though I don't, I mean, that like happened for me. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's that common. And I was, you know, the new kid on the block at that record. And actually when I auditioned, I didn't know that it was a series. I thought it was a pilot because most of the things I had done, I had mostly been working on camera at that point. I had done a ton of pilots, a lot of which for on camera, by the way, a lot of which didn't go. I did like five shows in a row that weren't made into series. And then the one I finally did get on the air was canceled after, before it, you know, the season was over. It was just like a whole lot of excitement and then disappointment excitement and, yeah. and hope and then crushed. And it was just like such a roller coaster. And I had always wanted to do voiceover. So I had been auditioning for like three years and getting to the end on so many things, I'm telling you. And when I say getting to the end, what happens is you get the call back, then you actually go to the studio. Then there's like only three to five of you maybe at the end. And you see everyone else that's auditioning. You're in the same line and you just go into the booth with all the directors and the creator. And, the, and you know, I would see the same characters all the time. I mean, humans, they're not really characters playing, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Um, actors, actresses. 
and I wouldn't get it. And I would, there was a point really close to getting Young Justice where I remember just standing outside the elevator at my agent's office in tears. And I was like, why do I keep getting called back if they're never going to give me the part? Like, this is just too disappointing. And what am I doing wrong? And why do I get to the end? And then I just don't clinch it at the end. I feel like, I feel like I'm stealing. I'm always doing sports metaphors just because that's what I was, like, I'm stealing the ball. I'm getting past everyone. I get right up to the thing. And then I like trip right before the, and he's like, no, it's not something that you're doing. Like yeah. you're doing something right. You wouldn't get called back. He was just giving me this pep talk. It's just, you know, it's scary to hire someone that has no resume. Yeah. And and then I'm like, but how do I get a resume if nobody <laughs> hires me? You know, and it's like, that's the catch 22, you know? And really what it's about is like still believing and still going. And I think it would be, would have been easier, honestly, if I wasn't getting called back, I would have, not easier, but it would have been like easier to quit. I would have said, okay, well, I'm not getting called back. No one's ever, I'm not getting any bites. Like obviously I'm meant to be doing something else. And I would have just tried the next thing. Yeah. But I was just getting close all the time and it was so hard to walk away. Um, so I just had to, and I like when I was telling you about volunteering, you know, I would immediately after not getting a part, which was every week, I would be like, I just need to go to the shelter. I need to go deal with like real stuff. Yeah. You know, like this is not life or death if I'm not getting a part. And I need to stop beating myself up and stop being so in my head and stop getting so crushed. I need to go, you know, do something that is real. Like the animals where I was working were like, you know, if they weren't rescued or they weren't cared for, if they weren't helped out and socialized, like it was life or death for them. So that was um, really powerful and grounding, like I said. And I would just throw myself into my volunteer work just to heal and help and remind myself like what, what really mattered. And then Young Justice happened. <laughs> and um, the first, I have to say, the first actual job I got was on a DreamWorks um, gig. And I was, it was like the Secrets of the Furious Five. And I got a small part. That was crazy. <laughs> that was crazy because I got a small part in this um, Kung Fu Panda franchise. And then they actually called like months later and asked me to come to the premiere. And I don't know, it was a companion DVD to yeah. the movie. I did, it wasn't the movie, but. I mean, Angelina Jolie, like just like all these people were there. And I was like, what? And I had to do a step and repeat, which I had never done, which you'd go on a red carpet and it was on. And I was, they were like, what are you wearing? And I was horrified. I'm like, uh, a dress from Marshall's. Like I, I didn't want, to, <laughs> like, I'm not taking off my sweater. I don't want anyone. I, what am I doing? Ah! Like it was very intimidating. And you know, you record in a bubble and you're not with other people. And so again, you know, and I'm a little clueless and I don't do all the research. I'm just very like in the moment that I'm in, that's just per- my personality anyway. So that was, um, crazy. And then the next thing was this young justice thing that I got a bite and I went to the callback. And again, I knew, you know, like I knew who Danica was, um, she was at the callback. And also I was reading for Miss Martian as well oh, as Artemis, okay. um, who was not even called Artemis at the time. <laughs> so, you know, I did my audition and I did my thing. And again, I was like, who was this person? Like when they, they had all these actors they knew and all these resumes that were long and this random girl. So I hear, I heard later Brandon was like, just kept coming back to me. Like they, they had other people and everyone was, and he was like, I like this girl for the character that I got. Um, not for Ms. Martin. (laughs) They're like, no, no. Uh, but you know, so when I got the call that I got it, my agent was so excited. He was the same one that had, you know, given me the pep talk. And, and he was like super excited to the point that I was like, why are you like, I can't believe you're so jazz. You know, it's just a pilot. We'll see what happens. He's like, no, it's not just a pilot. This is like 20 something episodes. I don't even, I think it was 26. And that's when I was like, Oh, no <laughs> way. I had no idea. So that was the first time. It, and honestly, up until that point, even all the pilots that I had done on camera, I hadn't been able to play one character over and over and over again. I was always, yeah. you know, trying to fight to establish who a character was. That's what you do in the beginning. And so Young Justice is so special to me for so many reasons, just as an actor, if you don't want to separate, which I don't always separate, but um, voiceover verse on camera, as an actor, that was like a beautiful, amazing experience because I got to be with this character as she grew 
and as her relationships evolved and really play the arc. And that was so awesome. Yeah. That sounds like it would be such a rewarding experience as an actor. After like, yeah, six or seven years of just pounding the pavement. Yeah. And all my little rewards were like, and you get to do one episode of it. <laughs> like, okay. So with that in mind, especially now that we've seen the season three trailer for, for mm. Outsiders coming up, I have to ask, what's it like coming back to Young Justice after like so many years away from it? And like, was it easy to slip back into, into the role of Artemis? So, so easy. So easy. I'm not going to lie. Like, she lives in my heart. So, you know, I don't have to think too hard or too deeply. There are characters that I do that are a strong departure. Yeah. But she's not for me. So, um, and she's grown and evolved as I have. So it's just, it was very natural. And, and I am so close to the material and to the creators and I trust them completely. And it was a lot of the same team involved. And so it felt like a reunion, not, um, it was not intimidating in any way. It was just exciting. If anything, I had to like dial back my enthusiasm, <laughs> and just like, be in the moment that she's in <laughs> like my actor enthusiasm yeah you just want to get up there and just scream because yeah. you're just so excited so i understand excited. yeah <laughs> uh and with that a friend of mine uh faith was actually very curious about how easy or hard it was for you to initially get to know artemis as a character back in season one when you were first starting and like what was your thought process with that yeah the only thing that was challenging for me because again you know, when you audition for these things, it's almost everything I audition for voiceover related. It is so veiled. Yeah. You don't know what you're auditioning for. They don't have really the actual character names more than half the time on there. You're speaking in code. So, and actually it's, it's a disservice to the actor sometimes because if you understood more of what was happening, you could probably do a better job. Um, but so you are just like, putting your best guess out there. And, you know, for me, and I think this is why I would get to the end on a lot of things. I don't lead from a place of fear. I always lead from a place of love. Yeah. And so I try to make choices that I love and that feel right to me. And I think a lot of times they're quote unquote wrong, um, but they stand out <laughs> and it's different. And it, you know, and it's something that gets me noticed and I go to the end and then, and then hopefully they direct me in the right direction. And then they see that I can take direction and then together, you know, again, maybe if I knew more from the beginning, I would make <laughs> those choices more informed, but I don't. And so I just do my thing and I try, I go balls to the wall and I just figure out as I'm going and I am not afraid to ask questions and say, you know, am I like... Am I upset when I'm about this? Or is this like the kind of thing that I'm not showing them that I'm upset about? Like, you know, I love layers. So I will ask all the questions I can. But when you're first auditioning, sometimes you're just alone. Yeah. And above yeah. nobody. And so there's nobody even to answer your questions. Um, but anyway, you were asking what was challenging in the beginning or faith was. So for me, <laughs> apparently this was one of those rare cases where all the choices that I made that were out there worked. So I was already coming into something that um, without my really knowing, but they knew, whatever my natural inclinations were, they were syncing up with whatever choices they had about who Artemis was, okay? So that was really working. But the stuff that I was not naturally inclined to do were the superhero things, okay? I was really good about sarcasm and, you know, like just – playing both sides of, you know, and playing the line of, you know, whether or not that could be considered good or bad or, and all my emotions being right out there, like, and um, just all of the stuff that makes her, her, but the stuff that they made fun of me for, which by the way, is fine. Like we're very playful. Yeah. It was like the way I said on my way. They, I remember one time, <laughs> and I think I talked about this before I said, you know, I'm on my way. And they were like, <laughs> <laughs> I was a superhero would say that. And so, you know, they were like, imagine, and I had to just, you know, I wasn't someone who watched a lot of superhero stuff. So then I started doing the research and yeah. started understanding I had to be on my way, you know, like I had to just bring this whole other energy. And that was kind of the stuff that was a little bit more challenging, but it's not like something that I didn't pick up pretty quickly. I just had to start watching that 
that genre. Yeah. And now you. And now it makes sense. No, no, no perky, happy, excited on my ways here in the superhero. Hey guys, you're to save the day, whatever you guys need. (laughs) (laughs) I I would love that. I'd watch that. (laughs) Yeah. It's a different show. Um, so building building on that, because uh, I was having this whole conversation with my friends and wondering about this. Like, are there any touchstones for you, like when you're trying to like get into that role as Artemis? Like each time you approach that role, like are there ways that you relate to her or that you get, or ways that you get into character through voice or physicality or psychology? Again, she's one of the characters that are really close to me, so it's yeah. not as um, intense of a thought process before I start. You know, like with Harvey Street Kids, that Audrey is such a different, like, not that she's not like me, but also, but she's just like, her stance is different. Like I get into a stance for her, but with Artemis, it's, it's just something that, um, in terms of touchstones, yes, I have emotional touchstones, but not in terms of a physical thing that I have to do other than when we're, we're actually fighting crime or in a superhero um, mode. But um, just for the normal conversations, she kind of lives pretty close. So um, the emotional touchstones, though, have more to do with the arc, you know, because we jump around in time. Sometimes I have to just remember where am I in terms of my trust level? Because, yeah. you know, she, that, those first that whole first season. And it's just like, nobody knows all the stuff that I've gone through. And, um, and there's so many layers of feeling conflicted about my family and having to go after them and having, not wanting people to know about my history and yet still loving them and wanting to be a part of them and wanting to fit in. And then, so it's just a lot of, you know, checking in with, okay, where am I on my journey in terms of, which completely relates to my own life, you know, on my journey of loving myself, wanting to be honest about where I'm coming from, kind of understanding who I want to open up to. And then, you know, getting to a point where also as she grows, not really caring who knows, because now you're more confident in who you are and you trust that these people care about you too. And, you know, just like all the things you go through as you evolve, in life, uh, hopefully not everyone does, but if you go to therapy and if you try to work on yourself and if you do, you know, understand why you do certain things and why those things don't serve you anymore and where you can use this and where you shouldn't use that and just, um, that journey, you know, emotionally. And then also obviously my relationship with Wally. And so it's, there's the family relationship and then there's my relationship with Wally. And then there's also, you know, my relationship with other members on the team. And so it's just touching in with where am I in, in my growth and my journey as a human being. Yeah. No, that's, that's really fascinating because she does have such, such an arc over the course of two seasons and how much mm-hmm. that she grows and changes. So. And in season three, people. <laughs> no spoilers. No spoilers. But we, we mm-hmm. assumed, we'd assume that there's going to yeah. be some growth. There always is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you were talking before about how you've done a lot of on-camera work before you got into voice acting and still do on-camera work. Well, I took a break, but now I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, for you, how are those two processes different, either in how you approach them or just in the way that they are, other than, you know, camera? <laughs> yeah. I mean, in terms of my acting approach, there there are some things that are um, a tiny bit different. But in terms of how the process goes down, it's, you know, vastly different. But um, I will say, c- going back to career day. Um, this was kind of fun. So I came into this class full of, um, five and six year olds and we talked about acting and moving around and how different people say water. And then I said, um, and this is actually true. I'm, uh, so this year I started working and recurring on a Nickelodeon show on camera and, um, and I asked all the kids, you know, it's a, it's about a family and there's a mom and a dad and there's cousins and there's, um, you know, I described all the characters on the show and I said, and who do you think I play? And all the kids together were like the mom. And I said, that's right. And, um, and you guys will be able to watch it and you'll see me. And, and they, a lot of them knew my son. And I was like, it's going to be a little weird. Cause like I have kids on the show, but they, they're not him. There's someone else, but they're just kids pretending to be. And, you know, and it's kind of about the situations that families go through. And I said, but would you also believe that I'm on a couple shows where I play the kid. 
And they were like, what? And I was like, yeah. And I'm on, I'm on some shows. Sometimes I'm, I'm even the pet. And they were like, what? And I, said, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, just think about it. Um, if you saw a little cartoon and you saw a little doggy and no I said actually just pretend you saw a dog everyone just picture a dog in your head so that I had them close their eyes and picture a dog and I was like does it sound like this and they were like laughing and I said or does it sound like and I started doing these different barks and so I was saying you know all of a sudden what you're picturing in your head changes and I kind of brought it on I'm like so how do you think trying that together that I could be on these shows if I look like this but I could play a little chihuahua and I could play maybe, or a little puppy, or I could play a big dog, or I could play a little kid. Um, and they said, you know, with some prompting, even though that was a lot of information, they were like, <laughs> figured out that I could be on a cartoon and that's the way I could play things that didn't look like me. And to me, that is the absolute gift. Yes. Doing this work because I love acting so much um, and I feel so limitless you know, when I get behind the microphone and nobody's looking at my physical appearance and I get, and I'm like a big character anyway, just who I am in life. I, I as you can tell, I just like keep talking. I love talking to people. <laughs> I love, I use my whole body. If anything on camera is actually difficult for me because I have to stay still. Yeah. And that's like the hardest thing for me. People will say sometimes, you know, I love what you're doing. And auditions are like, can we just, can you just dial it back? You pull it in. And that's a common problem for me. I have to like take my energy. It's always, it's always better to go too big though. Cause people can always rein you in. It's harder to get actors yes. to come out more. Maybe. I mean, it's been, for me, it's been a challenge, so <laughs> I don't know. But, um, but yeah, so that's been, that process for me has been like, so um, basically I think, that process is just awesome when I'm creating a character for voiceover because I can just really play and my imagination can run wild. And often when I'm doing an audition, I mean, I don't know if they like this, but I'm like, so I have three ideas. Um, hear me <laughs> out. You know, like I come in with all these options and then, but I, I always say like, I'm an actor in need of direction. And I feel that way in my real life. Like I wish someone was always telling me like, no, 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 just turn left. Um, and so that um, is my favorite, favorite, most exciting part of that. But on camera, I take a, a different approach um, when I'm building a character. You know, I have to think about wardrobe. I have to think about, you know, like I hate wearing heels. I hate wearing anything around my waist, honestly. If I could just wear moo-moos every day, I'd be happy. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, I have to think about like it's not about what I like and what I feel comfortable in. I have to think about how this person dresses, how this person would. And so it's a very different process. Um, and I did take a break after I had um, a baby and then accidentally got pregnant with twins. And that was like most lovely trauma I've ever experienced. And so I, I just couldn't do on camera. Like I was so out of body. I actually, I needed to act and I needed to go to my cartoons and my records. It was the most amazing thing to get out of the house and just have four hours where, you know, I got attention and love and support for my creativity yeah. um, and not for like, you know, needing to take care of someone else. And that was really a wonderful thing, but I would never have been able to go out and do on camera work. Like I didn't, I just, that required so much more of my brain than I had available. And, um, and I just wasn't comfortable in my body at that point. Like I was so tired and I, my balance was off. Like just sitting in front of a microphone was amazing. Yeah. So um, actually I think the twins were not even a year old and I did do an episode of a sitcom and that was the week that I was like, oh, I really can't, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I was exhausted. I was waking up before the kids got up and when I got home, they weren't there and I didn't see them and it just was like, this is too much. And even just sitting in hair and makeup was hard and I didn't, I just, I had to wear heels and I was like dancing and singing and which was theoretically fun prior to having children, but I was like not having fun. Um, yeah. and so that's when I really took a break and, um, and then when I decided to come back, I was ready and now, you know, I get excited and my, my twins are th just turned three. So they're, they're actually in school and my house is so, semi quiet sometimes, which it wasn't for three years straight, um, really five years straight. And so, 
I can actually think about what would a character wear and I can actually, I don't know, I have a moment to go to Marshall's and find, I don't like to spend a lot of money on the clothes because I'm only wearing them for the audition. Yeah. But, um, or this is like a turned into an advertisement for Marshall's. I also go to Target <laughs> and I also go, but um, yeah. It's Sponsorship. Just, yeah. TJ Maxx, uh, Nordstrom's Rack, whatever, anywhere that I don't spend a lot of money. But I just, uh, you know, I have to put a lot more time and energy and money into prepping for characters on camera and than I do for voiceover. So that, again, it's just, it's like this easy, awesome, wonderful portal into acting for me when I get to do voiceover. And I don't get to do nearly as much as I'd like to. You know, I don't work on that many shows. Um, So there are people when I'm going into these cartoons that I see at every cartoon that do like, that's all they do. Yeah. And that's not, it's not my main focus. I would love for it to be. If it, if I did enough that it supported me that I actually, I I used to say if I did enough that I wouldn't do on camera, but I've been enjoying my on camera jobs lately a lot. So I think this is just, I'm just doing what works for me right now. And again, that can shift. Yeah. You can always shift. And Mm -hmm. with that, uh, also, like, are there any ways that Young Justice was different from other some of the other voiceover work that you've done? Like, I know we've talked to some of the other actors about how Young Justice was unique because you all got to record together. But again, so so I'm the different person in the room for that answer because most of the people on that show, like, they only do voiceover, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, and that was my first experience doing it. <laughs> On a, on a series. And so I did it in a room full of people. Well, the next two shows I did after that um, regularly yeah. were DreamWorks shows where I also recorded in a group, which apparently, again, is it normal? <laughs> and then um, I'm doing a new show right now that I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, and actually they're recording in a group <laughs> too. So I don't know if that's just kind of the shows that I book. Now, I've done some, you know, where I'm by myself, but mostly all the video games I do, I'm by myself. I mean, actually, not mostly. All of them have been. I've never been in a group record for a video game. Um, And commercials, I'm by myself. But I've just been lucky enough, the series that I have been on have been group records. Even when I did a guest star spot on Curious George, which was the coolest thing ever, and I don't even know if that came out yet, there there was a group of people in that record. Um, So... I don't know. I'm just either spoiled or lucky, however you want to put it. Or, you know, maybe there's something like about my energy that that's what I've been calling into my universe. Who knows? It's bigger than me. Yeah. But yeah. Mm. For me, that that's what's been normal. Yeah. And I love, I love it. I love vibing off other people's energy. I love, I, I always say for me, acting is energy ping pong. We're like, I'm throwing it to you, you're throwing it to me. I'm blocking that shot <laughs> back, whatever it is, or I'm getting hurt by that shot, whatever it is. Absolutely. You know? So I love being in a room full of people. As someone who does act, it absolutely is. Yeah, it's a different it's vibe. So, mu- so much of what you do when you walk into a rehearsal is always just checking in with everyone's energy. So yeah, I completely agree. I can totally see that being so much easier. I will say, I was just thinking about this, the video game industry, it's different. You're not, you know, like you're not, when people play a video game, you're like playing it. And I think of it when I was little as the choose your own adventure books. (laughs) Yeah. So like, you know, whether you choose this, that, or that, you end up in these different worlds. So when I'm recording a video game, I'm recording a library. Like it's not an interactive scene. Oh, sometimes it is obviously, but not always. So I understand why we're not together. You know, I'm recording whether or not you decided to, you know, whether or not you played well and I'm commenting on your action, like great shot. Or I'm like, Oh, you should try that again. You know, like, so it's, it's really a different process and that's why the recording is different. It's used differently. So, I mean, it's like all these questions, if you think about it, have very valid understanding, understandable answers. Um, it just has to do with the medium. Yeah, absolutely. So after all of that, we also have a couple of Patreon questions from our wonderful patrons over on Patreon who, cool. who wanted to ask you a few things. Okay. So one of our patrons, David, uh, asks that Artemis apparently spends a lot of time uh, talking to herself in season two, and he was wondering if you do anything differently when you're voicing internal thoughts rather than dialogue with another character. Yeah, I think the only thing that's really, I mean, just think about it if you're talking to yourself. (laughs) You know, it's like, um, 
David, do you talk to yourself? Don't judge me. I actually do it too. Uh, whether or not it's, it's not just Artemis. Um, but yeah, you're just, it's kind of the ideas with the way you're thinking in your brain, you're running yeah. through different things. So, you know, it's obviously not as projected and you're not worried about how other people, if anything, you're talking about how you're worried about how other people <laughs> might perceive something. But I think when you're talking out loud, um, I always find dialogue to be kind of the tip of an iceberg. And if you think about that metaphor, there's so much going on underneath, but you only see the tip of the iceberg. So I might say, how are you? Um, or, you know, what, what's a better one than how are you? Um, <laughs> you know, what are you doing? That's a good one. So yeah. I actually did this during career day with the kids, but I was like having the kids come up to the mic and practice. And I was like, okay, imagine you're, um, you're the mom and you just walked in and your kids made a huge mess and they painted on the wall instead of the paper, which all of them were like, Oh, and so I was like, how would the mom say it? It's like, what are you doing? You know, like they, she might be mad or like, Oh, what are you doing? Like, you know, there's different ways that you can do that. Yeah. But you know, that is actually broadcasting what's underneath the iceberg. You're broadcasting the feeling of I'm so horrified. Oh my God, this is terrible. Or you're so mad. I told you not to do that. You know, or what if you came in and you saw your kids and they were drawing this beautiful card with flowers to say, I love you, mommy, and happy Mother's Day. You might be like, oh, what are you doing? Like, it means so much. You're still saying, what are you doing? That's the tip of the iceberg. But, you know, you have to think about all the stuff that's going on underneath. So now if we're talking about dialogue that's going on in my head, you don't need all that, right? Yeah. You are just like, okay, what is he doing? And you're, you're really just thinking about what is – you know, what is happening and you're not veiling and you're not using certain ways to say something that isn't really what you're saying or you're nervous to say this or you're, it's just your thoughts. Yeah. So again, I always answer these things from where I come emotionally instead of, I don't project as much. I speak much more monotone. I mean, it's like, yeah, I guess maybe that naturally happens, but I always come from my heart and my head and then my body follows. And the the emotions behind that are so much more interesting than like how the exact pitch of how you change your voice. It's the emotions behind it that give it more. I don't think about that. So like sometimes I have to ask for reference just in terms of whatever I'm recording because yeah. I forget. I just do. And I think actually more seasoned voiceover actors that do this for a living, I'm sure it started that way. And then they just get to a point where they know where to go physically or put their voice and it, telegraphs all of what I'm talking about. I, I'm just still maybe in the younger stages. Um, but that's just how I operate. Yeah. And if it works, it works. Yeah. That's what really matters. So we also have another question uh, talking about how the one of the most critical moments for Artemis's screen time is the end of season two with all of that emotional work going on mm -hmm. after Wally's death. So how did you prepare for acting that scene? One of our patrons is curious. Um, yeah, it's like preparing is such an interest. I don't really know like how to answer that. I, I just, I read a script. I immediately respond emotionally. Um, that's who I am. Uh, that's happened a couple times, you know, where Jason and I will text each other after we had read certain scripts and just share our emotional responses. I don't have to prep my emotions. Yeah. Um, I just go in and I close my eyes for a second. I take a deep breath and I feel what I would feel. Um, and then I perform. And the things that I need help with or that they direct me on are often physical. It's like, well, he's really far away. So you need to say that louder. <laughs> or, you know, it's just like, because you can't see it. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what they're drawing or so. <laughs> Or sometimes I just do it three ways just in case. But, you know, I'm lucky enough that they let me feel and perform and do my instinct first. And then they always direct me if it needs to be tweaked for a physical reason. But I don't feel like I'm always that far off emotionally. So that's helpful. One thing, um, I was just thinking of something where I had to be tweaked Uh that's not related to season two ending, but, um, but that's, a, I'm going off topic, but I'll just set, go back to season two. Um, no, it's you know, total, whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. I'll just say like, that was, that was 
devastating when I read that episode. And, um, and I don't think that any of us have to like, I mean, you, when you watched it and you love the show, <laughs> you were crying. Like I love the show. Yeah. You know, yeah, I was we were. really crying. So it's not, it's not like an acting thing, but there are times when I have to cry and you know, it's not like I, I'm not really crying because of something I can relate to. And that one, I was really crying because I didn't know if we were coming back. Like there's all this stuff going in. It was the last episode. I care about this show so much. Yeah. Like there's so much. I can't believe what, you know, this is a character I love, like, but I understood. And, you know, it's just like all those things played into it. Um, but there are auditions where I'm going in and maybe I'm, you know, having to channel something awful that actually hasn't happened to me, but I just tap into that feeling, whatever that character is having. And then something where that feeling did happen to me in life. And I can just connect the feelings, whether or not the scenario is the same. And if anything, the hardest part for me in terms of prepping is just getting my distractions out of the way. Um, this question is about how do you prepare, right? Not like, how do you relate? Cause I relate very instantly. If anything, I have to, maybe if I had a bad day that morning or I got found out I didn't get something or I'm just underslept or I don't know, I'm hungry or I ran into someone in the, in the waiting room that, you know, maybe there's something awkward happened. I, just anything right before you go in, you have to figure out how do I block out all that life and just, you know, channel and do the work that I need to do right now. And I'm not always successful at that. Um, maybe you're nervous and you can't catch your breath or your heart's racing too fast and the character isn't nervous. So <laughs> if I can't use that, I need to figure out how to get rid of that and not get rid of it, but work through it. You don't really get over things. I think you get through them. Um, and like recently I'm telling you, I got, I'm very sensitive to smell. So I got really into essential oils when I um, was pregnant and I was very nauseous all the time. And now I use, I have these rollers. I like roll it right underneath my jaw, like before I go in, cause like my jaw tenses up if I'm nervous about something and I'll just put like some lavender on and whatever, like this instantly makes me calm down a little bit. Um, yeah. so you just have to find out like what makes, makes you work and what blocks you. And then you have to, and you have to do all this stuff, not at your audition, but on your own time, when you feel it, start to recognize your own body, your own, you know, blocks, your own strengths, your own vulnerabilities, and then start to learn how to manipulate them so you can use them in an audition and also how to have control of them so they don't mess you up in an audition. So that's like all the prep work I have to do because I'm so human and, you know, I'm not a robot that just turns it on and off. And so I have to figure that out for myself. Um, and taking deep breaths and only counting to 10, holding my, you know, like all that kind of stuff, whatever I have to do. I had to learn, this was something that happened to me. I just like talk to everybody at auditions because I see all these people I haven't seen. I'm like, oh my God, it's on Instagram. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like talking to them. And then they're like, Stephanie, it's your turn. And I'm off, I'm off because I was talking about life. And so now I have to say, which is so hard for me. I have to say, oh my God, it's great to see you. Let's talk after. That shouldn't be that hard to say, but you know, in a waiting room, I would get so distracted and then it would throw me before I would audition. Even the casting director, I might, they're like, you know, talking to me about my kids and whatever. And I'll have to say, oh my gosh, let's talk about this after. Just, it's so awkward for me. I'm not good at saying no. Um, so learning to like put up a little protective bubble on myself, which again, does not come naturally and I'm still working on. I heard a quote though that really helped me. And the quote was, boundaries are not the same as putting up walls. It's just showing people where the door is. And I've always been bad at boundaries. So now I've started to learn, okay, I don't have to like explain away why I'm doing something and apologize. And I don't have to wall myself off completely. I can still talk to you about all these things. I just have to say, you know, here's the door. Like, let's do this work first and then let's talk about it after and just kind of set it up. And I, I had, that was like mind and heart blowing for me and it's been a gift. Um, so yeah, yeah that's how totally. I prep. I prep right. in that way. I don't, <laughs> the script, that stuff is easy for me. The feeling part is easy. And then for our last question, we have uh, the question of, were you able to make, to help create any of the uh, backstory or character choices for Artemis and, and then something related to that, but that first. <laughs> so in terms of like 
the writing of that character and her storyline, I think, you know, when it first began, that had that had nothing to do with me. Um, yeah. All of my own personal life experiences and story really set me up to make the choices that I made when I auditioned and they aligned, but that was not something that I, I knew at the time. Once I got brought into the fold and they explained everything to me, it was like, oh yeah, okay. Like it just made sense, but naturally I was already on the right path. Now, as the writers got to know me and the designers got to know me, like Phil and his team, things started to morph. Now it becomes more of a collaboration. Um, not on purpose from my end. I feel like they are just awesome at their jobs and they couldn't help but think of me when they were writing certain things and designing certain things. And so it kind of all starts to snowball. As many of the fans know, you know, when they gave Artemis and Wally a dog, they designed that dog off of my own dog. Well, guess who was like always talking about her dog every time she came <laughs> in to record for years? Like, so, and then also I was nonstop inviting everyone to come volunteer at the shelter or to donate for this dog because he needs this medica, you know, medical surgery. And like, so I was so big into my dog rescue that it, it kind of morphed and it became something that they wrote in, but I didn't know until I got the script <laughs> that that was happening. You know, that wasn't something that I got to say, excuse me, I'd really like if you <laughs> write an aunt, my, a dog for my character and you should write her, you know, to have a pit bull that looks like mine. And it's really <laughs> important to me that pit bulls are shown as, you know, family pets and not always shown in media <laughs> as these horrible animals that want to do terrible things. You know, this, this is a one-sided story in the media and we need to show these are three-dimensional, you know, living beings. And, you know, this is a societal pressure. I mean, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> I was just being me and they saw me and heard me and felt me. And then they did their job the way they do their job and it all coalesced. So I think, um, and by the way, by my bed, I still have a picture of the initial drawing of Bruce Lee, my oh, dog, wow. which, um, you know, was honestly one of the most amazing, touching, beautiful, affirming experiences I had as an actor just to feel so seen, felt, and heard, and appreciated. And that love was like so cool to receive when they gave that gift of putting him on the show. And so that happens even more in season three, I think. Um, so it just all, it all happened the way that it happened. And that's because we got to know each other as people. And um, when I was doing actually Comic-Con just recently in San Diego, I, you know, showed up with my own hair style the way I like it. And Phil said, you know, and I have, I got an undercut and I love my undercut. And, um, because personally, like I want to shave my head all the time, but <laughs> I, I know that's just something I want to do. Um, I just don't want to deal with hair. And also I will say this, I think that it goes deeper. I remember in high school they were doing superlatives and like, I didn't win most likely to succeed. I didn't win. Um, most talented. I didn't win. Like I got best hair and I hated it. I was like, yeah. that's all you see of me. Like I felt really devastated. And it's like, I guess instead I could be appreciative that people like my hair and, uh, <laughs> um, but I wasn't. Yeah. And, um, and that doesn't, you know, I'm not negating anyone's experience that has a trouble with hair. I just, that was, something that I didn't think about and I didn't feel um, connected to. And so I think, yeah, I also love Emma from March for Our Lives. That girl is a real yeah. life superhero. And when I saw her Seriously. out there on the news um, speaking truth to power, the next day I went to my um, – hair, the woman who's been cutting my hair, Cindy, for a long time. And I was like, I want you to shave my head. And she was like, that's really extreme. Um, <laughs> and I was like, yes, but I looked up the femme undercut and I can still do, cause I'm an on-camera actor and it's, I can't just do that unless the character yeah, yeah. that I booked and someone's paying me a lot of money to do that. But I have to match my headshots. I have to like, you know, be semi morphable and that's a really strong character choice. Um, and kind of limits me. So physically again, but 
my point is I could do it underneath and I could still get the best of both worlds. And so like everything underneath my ears was shaved off and then I could put designs in every couple of months, whatever I'm <laughs> feeling. And so anyway, that was just something exciting for me. And I decided to put arrows underneath my head for Comic-Con, for Artemis. Oh, that's and it's just like fantastic. Yeah. And for Audrey, um, she wears a, which is a Harvey Street character. When I was doing stuff for her, I did lightning bolts, like, cause she loves lightning bolts. And I just, I think it's a fun thing. And my son and I went and got, you know, matching shaved like he did it on the side of his head you could really see it but I yeah. didn't. but you know it's just a fun thing that I do anyway Phil said something to the effect of you know in season four don't be surprised if Artemis has an undergun <laughs> and I was like you know I don't know if that will happen by the way but if it did of course, of course. I wouldn't be surprised and it would be so cool it would uh, be really cool so like I know all my answers are so long-winded and I'm sorry but you know, it's you don't just, need to apologize for being excited about things. Not am, on the show. I'm excited about it. And I don't know what will happen, but that's kind of how it wor- has worked for me. I don't know that every actor has that experience. I don't know that every actor gets to know like every person that works on the show the way I do. Like I recently went to the wedding of one of the awesome designers on Harvey Street Kids and I like did not see it. I saw one other actor there, but it was all their designers and writers. But that's just who I am. I love I really am collaborative. I don't think that it's all just me. I know I'm very aware that there is a team of people that make up every character that I get to work on and we we create these together. And so, you know, I love meeting all the other artists and what they do and how they do it. And then it becomes naturally more collaborative when you know the whole team of people working on the character, I think. Absolutely. Just Mm -hmm. everyone coming together to make something incredible. Yeah, but we don't work together. Like that's the thing in voiceover. Like, true. I do my thing, and then someone's designing a character, but they're listening to my voice for two years, but I never even meet them, so they know. <laughs> like they know it's just weird. Like I have to seek them out at the rap party if, and be like, "Are you the person that designs?" What you know? And they're like, "Oh, I do the fight sequences." I'm like, "Oh, blah, 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 blah. you know, like my husband's in Krav Maga, and I've taken Krav Maga, and they're like, "Yeah, her fighting is really Krav Maga style, like really street fighting." You know, so like I love that kind of stuff. I, but. Yeah. You know, I have to seek that out. Yeah. But it must be so rewarding, that community. Once you seek that out, having all of that together sounds it's incredible. Cool. Yeah. It's cool. So for everyone. Thank thank you so much for spending some time with us in the Watchtower today, Stephanie. Where Emily, I have people- to say it's weird to talk all this and then like not talk about you. I these conversations are hard <laughs> I'm like, you're just asking me questions about me. I'm like, I didn't ask about you and what you do. Like this feels very one sided, but I know that we're supposed to be skewing it just to, you know, this podcast and what it's about. But I will say I love what you guys I can't not talk about you. <laughs> Give me one second before we wrap. But I just love what you guys have done. I love um, the attention to detail that you have here and the heart that you put into it and the professionalism. And I think this is such a wonderful community and I don't have a lot of time to listen to podcasts, but I did make an effort when we were driving down to San Diego for um, Comic-Con to listen to many (laughs) of the episodes and I love them. You know, there's humor, there's thought put into these questions. You're, you're so open and you really care and I appreciate all of y'all. Okay. (laughs) And all the patrons that are like, you know, working to keep you guys going this is awesome. What a, what a sweet community. And I'm so glad to be a part of this podcast today. We're glad to have you. Thank you so much. We love our community. We love being able to bring people like you and the rest of the cast and crew on. It is This this doesn't happen if you guys don't do what you do. So yeah, but you built it. So. <laughs> you built it first and then they came. Remember that. If you build it, they will come. You built something True. good. So the players True. have shown up. <laughs> Thank you so much. So... Before we wrap up, where can people find you here on Earth Prime on social media? Oh, social media. It's a blessing and a curse. Or anywhere um, else. Anywhere else you want to direct people. No, no. I mean, you're working listen, on? apparently it matters now. So I'm trying to get better at it. Um, I'm trying to embrace social media. I'm not like the best at Twitter. If, if anything, I go on there for news. So I actually, you know, look at it like, if there's news that I think that is newsworthy or that someone says something in a way that I appreciate or it resonates with me, I retweet it. You know, that's really all that I do. I feel like that's so actorly of me, but I'm just like (laughs) saying other people's lines. Every (laughs) once in a while, if I remember, I think about it, I might actually write my own tweet, but yeah, it's not really that. um, I think if anything, you can just read into what I'm retweeting and that's a way to get to know me. But if anything on, on Instagram is something I really like, cause I am pretty visual and, um, 
And as I was getting back into the on-camera world this past year, you know, all of my team was like, you need updated pictures. You need to show them online. You need to know what you look like. And that was really weird for me too. Cause like taking pictures of myself just feels weird. I want to be other people. I don't want to show pictures of me all the time. Um, prior, I didn't mind showing pictures of me behind her microphone or like doing what I like to do with other actors. Cause it's just exciting. And you're like, look, this is what we look like, you know, when we're recording. Cause I know fans like to see that, but, um, if anything, I'm just putting pictures out there that I think show different sides of me anyway, and different characters that I can be I hopefully, and then trying to write it with, um, you know, captions that mean something to me or that are maybe something to think about. But yeah, I would love an interaction with um, more people on Instagram because that's kind of a fun way for now. It's probably going to be something new next year. Um, I don't really do Facebook. Uh, what else? I don't even know what Snapchat is. <laughs> But that's all awesome. We will yeah. include links to your Instagram and Twitter down in the show notes if yeah, anyone isn't definitely. already following you, because cool. they should be. But uh, thank you also to everyone for sharing some time with us. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. Our email address is whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And you can also find us on YouTube if you go to crashingthemode.com backslash YouTube. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or whatever podcatcher you use. The ratings help others find the show. And if you leave us a rating, please let us know, especially if you're outside the US. We have to look a lot harder to find those because the internet wants to make our lives difficult sometimes. And even though season three is officially announced and is coming in January and we are all so excited to see what happens, Please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series and hashtag buy YJ comics on Comixology or read them over on the DC Universe app to hopefully get us some more stories even uh -huh. sooner if we can uh -huh. and to get yourself up to speed for the season three premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.